thank you very much for letting me participate in your meeting. I'm sorry I can't be there, but um, right now I'm on an airplane flying to Hawaii. So it was, would have been pretty challenging to do that. <laughs> I don't think the reception in the air is quite that good. Um, I'm happy today to talk to you about one of my passion projects, which is looking at uh, quality of life in immune thrombocytopenia. And basically just, uh, I'm trying to give you a brief overview of what, what's involved. So just to let you know, again, I'm from Canada and I'm from this place with the star at the bottom here, Ottawa. Um, so the capital of Canada, which is basically between Montreal and Toronto. And just to give you an idea, so that's the UK sort of, just the distances in Canada are pretty phenomenal. And actually I did a sabbatical where I spent three months in, the, in Southampton and I did a little trip from Southampton down to Cornwall. And that's roughly the distance between um, Montreal and Toronto, just to give you an idea. So, and, and just to prove it to people, I actually did it on, I did Google Maps and show you my trip. So this is what we did is we went from Southampton to Oxford to Bath, uh, down to Dartmoor and into Cornwall. And that took, you know, total over six hours and basically going from Montreal to Toronto through Ottawa takes about the same amount of time. Interestingly, I like this fact that it's, it would be one day of walking where it'd be two days of walking in Canada. And I can tell you that it'd be a lot more fun walking <laughs> walking through um, uh, Dartmoor and that than walking on the 401 highway to, to Toronto anyways. Um, just a little introduction. Anyways, just uh, and now I'm happy to share with you about my, my passion again about quality of life. And first of all, I'll talk about what is quality of life and how can you measure quality of life? Um, and, you know, ba basically going through how we do that measurement and then come to a conclusion at the end. So ITP, as you guys well know, is a chronic disorder, which can have, well, it can be acute, acute but the most impact is the one when it's going on for a chronic um, disease, which can have a significant impact on patients and families' ability to function normally. And so in Canada, we had a group of us who got together and we decided to try to measure this um, issue. So what is quality of life? So the long version is it's an individual's perception of their position in life in the context of their culture and value systems in which they live in relation to their goals, expectations, standards, and concerns. So that's kind of the long explanation, but I like this kind of short one. This is from the World Health Organization. Uh, it's the gap between one's life expectations and life experiences. So quality of life is out of necessity is, um, a subjective concept. So the question is, is how do you take a subjective concept like quality of life and sort of make it measurable so that we can see what the impact of treatments are, for instance, on that construct. So I'm just gonna take a little one step further and it's to health related quality of life. And so that basically refers to the specific impact of a condition or illness on overall quality of life. And it doesn't typically include non-medical constraints such as religion and finance, although I argue that finance can be an important issue for, and especially in ITP because of the expensive drugs we do. So I think that's one of the things we're actually looking at is when we originally set this up before the expensive drugs came out, finances wasn't an important issue. And when we're revising things, we're realizing that being able to pay for these expensive medicines actually can be important. I know people think in Canada we have universal health care, but we don't have universal farm drug program. So actually getting my, my patients access to medications can be very frustrating. Anyways, the, the term health-related quality of life is often used interchangeably with quality of life. Um, so there's no gold standard test. You can't take a blood test and say this is what your quality of life is. Um, so we typically use a questionnaire to get at that. Um, the simplest way is to have people plot it on a visual analog scale, and I'll show that a little bit later, um, which is to give you an overall score. But sometimes you get a bit more, what you really like is a bit more detailed idea of where the areas in, of quality of life are affected. And we look at different areas called domains, sort of mental health, physical health, social health, um, th those aspects. Um, so there's ty types of quality of life questionnaires, and I, I'm going to briefly mention at the top, there's a preference-based uh, questionnaire called utilities. 
and they're used primarily for um, uh, financial analysis for um, cost benefit. So the NICE in the UK is kind of the world leader on this, and um, that's the National Institute of Health Care. Um, I can't remember the, the E is uh, basically. I can't remember the last term, but anyways, basically, it's looking at how to find the most um, effective care uh, for the least amount of money. Basically, value getting value for your your dollar. So that's that's what's going on all the time, and, and I'm sure you're very, all very familiar with Nice. Um, but what I tend to focus in on is uh, questionnaires that are either generic, and I'm a pediatrician, so I know there's a one called the Pete's QL. Um, you may be more familiar with one called an adult quality of generic quality of life tool called the SF36, and there's newer tools that have come out called Promise, which actually very interesting because they um, they actually use a cat where you can select questions to be asked depending on what your initial selection are they can actually do more detailed um, depending on what what your initial answer is and so I think that's kind of the probably the way going forward um, and then there's disease specific tools which is my passion because I, I helped develop the kids ITP tools there's an adult tool called the ITP pack and it was developed by um, um, Amgen with outside expertise. And it's actually a very good tool, but it's not used as much because it was developed by a specific uh, industry partner. I think that's kind of limited a bit its access to its use, but it is a very good tool. Um, so just to get a little bit more into this whole generic versus disease specific quality of life. So generic, the big advantage of a generic tool is you're able to compare between um, the healthy population and other disease groups. So you can say a patient with chronic ITP has this quality of life compared to a patient, say, who has leukemia or has rheumatoid arthritis. So you can compare across disease groups. Um, but the problem with it is that, and sorry, you can also compare to the healthy population, which is also very helpful. But the big problem is that it doesn't hone in on what's important. And particularly, I think a disease like ITP is very a good example of that, in that it doesn't tend to affect, for, for instance, your, your average activities of daily living, you're able to climb stairs, you're able to, you know, go do gardening, that kind of thing. But it, what the real focus is, is on sort of the emotional and worry component of ITP, which is not covered by most of the generic quality of life tools. So that's the downside of those. Disease specific tools, they focus on dimensions that are really most likely to be affected, so it really hones in on what's important. And the good thing about it is it's more sensitive to change. The downside is you can't really compare between, because it's specifically for the disease, you can't really compare across disease groups or to the healthy population. Um, but best, so it's oftentimes best to have a combination of both so that you can do both. You can get a very sensitive assessment um, and pick up subtle changes if you bring in a new treatment and then have a generic tool so you're able to compare uh, across disease groups. Um, so this is, I was talking about a visual analog scale, and this is a, the one that's used quite a bit. It's called the Euroqual EQ5D. And, and you can see basically what you do here is, is your own state of health today. You draw a line from this box to somewhere on this line, which basically is from your best imaginal state of health and your worst imaginal state of health. And so today I'm feeling pretty good. So, and it's nice and sunny outside. So I'll give myself a 90, for instance. Um, but you know, that, that can change. Like I say, it's a really, and people are very good at telling you what their quality of life is there. So I think people have a really good sense of that. I think what you lose in that is the detail you lose. Okay. So why is, why did Rob put a 90 today? Um, you know, what, what goes into that? Um, and so, so that's where a, a, a more nuanced assessment would be important. So, uh, so if you're gonna develop a measure for a quality of life, how do you go about doing it? You generate potential items that are gonna, that are important. So we use, an, in the past, they always used an expert group where it was just healthcare professionals. But now we realize the most important for people are actually the patients, so, uh, and the families. So we do patients and families and ask them what's important to you for your quality of life. 
And then you select the most important items to be included in the measure to, to narrow it down uh, so that you don't have hundreds of questions. You can narrow it down to the most important ones, and then you pilot it out and check it out with a, a, um, a, group, a group of patients. So just to give you an idea, so this was Dr. Dorothy Bernard, who's a, a, and Dr. Victor Blanchetta in, in Canada. Uh, she's in Halifax and Victor's in SickKids. Um, basically, they did a study which involved interviewing 140 parents and 95 children and uh, generated 100 items. And then they kind of whittled them down to 26 items, a bit more manageable. And this was what developed the kids ITP tools, which I was very involved in the publication. Um, and this is just to quick give you an idea of, of what it looks like. So it's just basically questions and uh, with, uh, you know, there's response items never, seldom, you know, to always. And you can kind of go through that. This is just the first page to give you a flavor of it. And I'll just hone down on a few questions just because, um, so, you know, for instance, with, with children, it's, I was bothered that I cannot do the activities I like, and you can sort of see where that is. And I think many, many parents find this, this question of fun is, I was frustrated with my parents, more frustrated with my parents than usual, because they're hovering basically at the helicopter parents who don't let their kids do things. Um, so that actually was, was, the kids pointed out that that was an important issue. Um, and this is just a, an example of what can be done. So this is a clinical trial, very small pilot study of looking at Ramaplostin versus placebo or remiplostem, uh, however, however you want to pronounce it. But um, you can see that, and this is, a, this is a looking at the parent impact score. So we had a, one for the child, but we also had one for the parent looking at how the illness impacted on them. And you can, so to be transparent, the, the child, there was no obvious change in the scores over the study. Again, it's a small group, um, but you can understand Romoplostum is an, an, an injection once a week under the skin. So the kids may or may not be, um, you know, that may or may not be a good thing, even though they're having less bleeding, but now they've got this injection under their skin. But for the parents, this was a, there was a significant improvement. So you can see this is scored from zero is the worst possible health and hundred is the best possible health. You can see that, you know, both placebo group and the Romoplostum group started around 35, for instance. And then you can see um, at week five, it went up, you can see it went up to roughly 50 and then it went to over 60 by week 13 of treatment. So there's a definite impact on the parents on this of this medication. So that I think was very, very interesting. And then you could argue, well, are we gonna give this medication to improve the parents' quality uh, to the child? So that's, that's a whole other thing to talk about. Um, so when you develop a tool, you know, so we developed it in North America. Then you have to think about, okay, how do we, how does this work in other jurisdictions, and other cultures? So um, you have to make sure that it works in different cultures and languages. And uh, so, for instance, in developing countries, the issues may be different and may be different than what's happening in sort of more developed nations. For instance, an indigenous population, one of my colleagues spends a lot of time working with indigenous in Canada, and they have very different focus. When they, when you look at quality of life, their focus is very, quite different than our perspective. So I think it's important to keep things do that. But when you translate a tool to another population, you need to do cross-cultural translation. And, and even like North America to UK, you think you wouldn't need to do that. But we found, for instance, one of the first questions was, I felt sick which in North America just means overall not feeling unwell, but that didn't work in the UK because sick is very specific. And so we actually changed the wording to, I felt poorly. So just to give you an idea that even you think there shouldn't be any difference between the UK and North America, but there, there definitely was. So using these tools outside of where it's developed, you have to be careful of that piece. And here's a, um, one of the studies we did where we looked at the child scores, um, looking, comparing newly diagnosed patients um, to patients with chronic ITP. And you can see that it, across countries, we didn't have enough patients in Uruguay to have that, but you can see that uh, very consistently, France, Germany, and the UK, the scores were lower for the newly diagnosed patients and they improved 
um, were better for the chronic ITP patients, basically, because humans are very good at adapting to their circumstance. When you have a new something newly thrust upon you, it's very stressful, it, it has a major impact on your quality of life, but then you adapt so that when if you've had the disease for a year, you're able to kind of, okay, I'm, I'm in the setting. But the other thing I want to point out is the wide, so this is a, called a box plot. And what, what it means is there's a the line in the middle is, is the medium, so the mean value of all the scores. And then the, um, you can see this is the sort of the 75th and the 25th percentile. So this is where the majority of patients scores are. But you can see there's quite a wide, this is the 95th percentile. So you can even have some patients in France, for instance, who, uh, there's one patient who scored uh, quality of life below 40 and another patient who scored it almost at 100%. So there's quite a wide variety. So that's why you have to, it it's, can be useful, um, uh, useful to kind of following things over time, but an individual patient may have a very different perspective of their quality of life, um, even with the same illness. So, just get kind of wrapping things up at this point. So I think it's it's kind of, it's possible to take this subjective concept of quality of life and make it valid, reliable, and responsive. Um, there are still a number of challenges that need to be considered. So again, I, we mentioned this whole issue of generic versus disease specific tools um, and how do, how do we work around that, cultural and language issues paper versus electronic. Fortunately, we're moving more and more towards electronic, but still the practicalities of getting these tools and putting them into an electronic format that's user-friendly that for both the patient side and the um, healthcare provider side is, is a real challenge. And that's something I'm working on right now. Um, and then clinical versus research. Most of the time, these tools have been used in the research setting. For instance, as I showed a clinical drug trial, but I think more and more, we really wanna get this integrated into clinical care so that when you go in to see your doctor, you fill in the questionnaire and they get those responses and they can have it when you're coming for your visit so that they can be highlighted that these are the issues that are specifically uh, a problem for you. Um, and, and you can be more efficient at kind of uh, tackling those, those topics. So that's a whole other area that we're working on. I know the group in the Netherlands is doing an excellent job of that and we're trying to copy them in Canada, but again, it's a very slow process. So um, I think at that point, I'll just wrap things up. And again, sorry, I'm not with you and I'm, I won't be available for the, the question and answer, but I know Dr. Grace has worked with me quite a bit in um, using the kids ITP tools. So I'm sure she can, answer many of your questions. If if she can't, please, um, uh, I'm sure they can collect, you can email, and I'll be happy to answer those by email at, at a later date. So uh, anyways, have a really good meeting, and it's uh, thank you for letting me talk. Much appreciated.